Welcome, everyone. Well, it's always a great event for us to have a special guest. And as your pastor, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker. Now, my friend, Mr. Douglas, escaped the horrors of slavery in 1838, some 34 years ago, as a 20-year-old man. He then traveled to England and returned later to America as a free man. Several of his friends contributing to purchasing his freedom. He then toured many parts of our nation with Mr. William Lloyd Garrison and fellow lecturers. Now, Mr. Douglas published and edited his own newspaper, The North Star, for many years, and just recently in Washington, he has begun to publish his weekly newspaper, The New Era, with his sons, and he has written two books that I know that many of you have read and been quite moved by, and he was appointed secretary of a commission to Santo Domingo last year. Now, Mr. Douglas had audiences with several U.S. presidents, and he contributed to the Emancipation Proclamation with great effect with President Lincoln and his two sons, Lewis and Charles, fought in the Massachusetts 54th and his other son, Frederick, was very involved with recruiting. Now, Mr. Douglas is in the movement for amendments to our U.S. Constitution, and he has personally risked his own life, often trying to secure those freedoms and liberties offered to us in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. And he has personally endured the cruelest treatment of his so-called masters and others in his path, believing that he could cling to almighty God in sorrow and eventual joy. And I tell you, he is personally an inspiration to me as well to thousands of others who have been illuminated by his journey. So, will you Welcome with me, Mr. Frederick Douglass. Thank you, Reverend Brewster. It is a blessing for me to be with such fine people on this occasion. It is true, I was born a slave in America, in the state of Maryland, and the Lord has given me many adventures since my escape from those bonds. I suppose myself to be born about the year 1817. I will recount as part of my message a few excerpts from my books regarding my childhood and my life journey. A mysterious individual was the object of terror for me as a small child. Among the inhabitants of our little cabin, he was under the ominous title of Old Master, had several farms and overseers on it. Unhappily for me, the only information I could gather concerning him only increased my great dread of being carried thither as a seven-year-old boy of being deprived and separated from the protection 
of my loving grandparents. So you see, I wanted to remain little forever, for I knew that the taller I grew, the shorter my stay would be in the only home I ever had. But I was not to remain there long. I was soon to be taken to the old master house. I was a slave, and although this fact was incomprehensible to me, it conveyed to my mind a sense that my entire dependence was at the will of somebody I had never seen. And for some cause or other, I was made to fear this somebody above all else on earth. And this brings me to my scripture for our talk. The 23rd Psalm is a type of road map for me, and I hope its boundless truth and courage in it will strengthen each of you as well. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let us begin there. I truly love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I love the Christianity that's full of mercy and good fruit without hypocrisy. I love the Christianity that makes its people do what they say they're gonna do and not what has often been passed as Christianity in our nation. If you demand liberty for yourself, I say you must grant it to your neighbor. However, from my earliest recollection on serious matters, I had the ineffaceable conviction that slavery would not always be able to hold me within its foul embrace. And it was this conviction, this word of living faith, that strengthened me through the darkest trials of my life. And to him, I give thanksgiving and praise. I only remember seeing my mother in her visits to me in the kitchen of the old master, few in number, brief in duration, and mostly in the night. But the pain she took, the toil she endured to see me tells me that a true mother's heart was hers and that slavery had difficulty in paralyzing it with unmotherly indifference. I indeed was taken to Baltimore when I was nearly 12 years old. My master there left me almost exclusively to the management of his wife, Mrs. Sophia All. The frequent hearing of my mistress reading the, the Bible, for she often read the Bible when her, all, her husband was absent, awakened my curiosity in respect to this mystery of reading and my desire to learn. I frankly asked her, teach me to read. And without hesitation, the dear woman began the task. Very soon I was master of the alphabet and I can spell words of three and four letters. But when Master All found out, he unfolded to her the true philosophy of slavery and the peculiar rules between mistresses and masters in the management of their human chattel. He promptly forbade her continuance of her instructions. His words on me, cold and harsh, sunk deep into my heart. And it not only stirred up this feeling of rebellion, but it awakened this slumbering train of vital thought. I had already seen an example of his cruel attack on a young lady in our household. And I was shocked at the wretchedness of her life. Knowing that I could be his next victim, I was stunned, but I understood from that exact moment the direct pathway from slavery to freedom, and it rendered me more resolute to seek intelligence. However, my mistress was checked in her benevolent design. The good lady not only ceased to instruct me, but she set her face aflint against my learning to read by any means necessary. The power of the husband was victorious. 
But all this was all too late. I had begun to use my young white playmates with whom I met in the streets as teachers. I carried a copy of the Webster spelling book in my pocket. And when sent on errands, when time permit, I step aside with my young playmates and take a lesson in spelling. I paid my boys with, with bread for a single biscuit. Any one of my hungry little comrades would give me a lesson far more valuable to me. Then bread. It makes me lie down in green pastures. So, when I was about 13 years old, I succeeded to learn how to read. I was able to obtain a, a, a popular school book, the Columbia Orta. Oh, a rich treasure, almighty documents, all choice readings. And I read them over and over again, adding much to my limited stock of knowledge. I got a bold and powerful denunciation on oppression and a most brilliant vindication on the rights of man. I was able to penetrate the secret between all slavery and oppression, and I ascertained its true foundation to be the pride, the power, and the avarice of man. Oh, there was a short dialogue in it between us, a master and a slave who had been recaptured. An argument is ensued and the slave is abraded and told to answer. And he says, he knows that anything he says would have little avail since he is completely in the hands of his master. And that I submit to my fate. Touched, the master begins to recount all the good deeds he's performed for the slave and then ask him to speak again. Thus, Having been invited to a debate, the slave makes a spirited defense of himself and arguments for and against slavery were brought out. The master is vanquished by every turn. And seeing this, he meekly emancipates the slave with best wishes for his prosperity. It is scarcely necessary for me to say that such a dialogue with such an ending read when the fact that my being a slave was a constant burden of grief to me powerfully affected me. After this, I felt the need of God as a father and protector. I was awakened by this regard by, by the preaching of a white Methodist minister, Hansen. He felt that all men, great and small, bond and, and free, were sinners in the sight of God. And they had to, re to repent of their sin and be reconciled to God through Christ. I consulted a good colored man named Charles jo Johnson, who, in tones of holy affection, told me to pray. I finally found that change of heart which comes when one casts all one's cares upon God. And by having faith in Jesus Christ as a friend and as a redeemer and as a savior for all those who diligently seek him. After this, I saw the world in a fresh light. I seemed to live in a new world animated by new hopes. I loved all mankind. Slaveholder, not accepted. But I abhorred slavery even more now than ever. My great concern now was to have the whole world converted. I would gather pages from the Holy Bible from the dirty street gutters of Baltimore, and I washed and dried them so I can get a word or two of wisdom from them. I got acquainted with a good old colored man named Lawson, a more devout man than he I had never seen. He not only prayed three times a day, but he prayed while he was walking down the street, while he, while he was in his wagon, while he was at work. His whole life 
was a life of prayer. I went often with him to prayer meetings without the knowledge of master. He could read a little, but I, I was a great help to him in that regard. I taught him the lessons, but he, he taught me the spirit. Master threatened to whip me when I, he knew that I had gone with Uncle Lawson, but I went anyway despite the threat. Uncle Lawson was my spiritual father. He told me that he had been shown that I must preach the gospel and that I had great work to do and that the Lord is expecting me to prepare myself to do it. Still away, still away, still away to Jesus. In a horrible irony at that time in this Christian country, men and women were hiding from professors of religion in barns and in woods and in fields, all in order to read the Holy Bible. But a pious man named Mr. Wilson asked me to help him teach a, a small schoolhouse in the home of a free color man named Mr. Mitchell who lived in a nearby village. Here was something to live for, good work, teaching children to read the gospel of God. And we were doing so when rushed in a mob headed by class leaders of the church we belonged to, forcing us out, armed with sticks and missiles, commanded that we never meet for such a purpose again. The hypocrisy, you can see. Oh, I'm sure. I will here spare you a chapter of greater horrors and of heart sickening details which I experienced at that time, which deeply affected me. And while I heard of numerous murders committed by slaveholders, I had never heard of one solitary instance where a slaveholder had been imprisoned or hung for murdering a slave. By the time I was 20, another incident occurred, which I will also spare you from, your, from problems. But it involved Master All, who had supposedly converted to Christianity and had exhibited far more cruelty and meanness to me than ever before. He resolved to put me out 
after years of my suffering severe whippings by him, for one year, he said, to be broken by a man famous for doing so, Edward Covey. It suffice to say that for the next six months, I suffered far more golden and bitter attacks than ever before with Master All. I suffered bodily as well as mentally. Mr. Covey the Snake, we called him, goaded me almost to madness. I cried out, oh Lord, save me. I only have one life to live. Protect me, God. I might as well be killed running than die standing 100 miles north and I'm free. With God's help, I will. But the contemptible covey, through a series of incidents, created the occasion for my one last flogging. After a previous bloody attack by this brute, and after I went back to my master for mercy and justice, who only sent me back to him, I vowed to stand up for myself if he attacked me again, which he did very soon in the barn, while I was attempting to obey an order of his to feed the horses. The snake grabbed me and was endeavoring to slip a knot around my leg. I found my fingers around the throat of that cowardly tormentor. Every punch of his was, was parried by mine, and Covey trembled and demanded, are you going to resist your scoundrel? And I looked straight in his eyes and I said, yes, sir. You have goaded me and treated me like a brute for the last six months and I will stand it no longer. After a long battle of many blows, Covey now bloody in the cow yard, finally gave up the contest, huffing and puffing and pretending as if he won. And he said, get back to work. All this time, my aim was not to hurt him, but to prevent him from hurting me. He never laid the, the weight of his fingers on me again. It was the turning point of my life as a slave. I was a man now. I had got to a point where it didn't matter whether I lived or died. The spirit, it made me a free man. In fact, while I remain a slave in form, he leadeth me beside the still water on the third day of September. 1838, in accordance with the resolution I made to do so, I bade farewell to the city of, of Baltimore and to slavery through my escape. I'd had help from my dear and trusted friend Anna, who worked near the docks where I worked. In the days before, there were moments when I and others with me shared thoughts of Hamlet the Dane, thoughts that we would rather bear those ills we had than fly off to those we knew not of. No man can tell the intense agony felt by a slave when he's wavering at his escape. Everything he has is at stake, and everything he has not is at stake too. But I believe there was not one man among us who would not have rather been shot down than to have passed away life in hopeless bondage. The flight was a bold and perilous one, met by many, many dangers that the Lord carried me through. So there I was in the great city of New York, without loss of blood or bone in less than one week from escape in Baltimore. 
I was walking among the rushing throngs and gazing at the dazzling wonders of Broadway, the dreams of my childhood, the purpose of my manhood now fulfilled, free state all around me, free earth under my feet, a whole new world just burst upon my agitated vision. It was a, a moment of joy and excitement that no, that no words can describe. I felt as if I had just escaped a den of hungry lions. Anger and grief, like darkness and rain, can be described. But joy and gladness, oh, it's like a rainbow of promise that defies the pen and pencil. For 15 years, I had been dragging a heavy chain with a, with a huge block attached to it. The chain was now severed, and God and right stood vindicated. I was a free, a free, free man. Didn't my Lord deliver? Daniel, deliver, Daniel, deliver, Daniel. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not and every man? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then I wonder this man. <laughs> <laughs> However, I was soon taught that I was still in enemy's land. I hadn't been in New York before a few hours when I was met by a fugitive slave well known to me, Alanda's Jake who, while in New York, said he was William Dixon. He said that he had just narrowly escaped from being recaptured and that there were many Southerners now in the city coming back from the Springs and that the black people in New York were not to be trusted and that there were hired men on the lookout for fugitive or slaves and that for a few dollars I could be put back into the hands of a, of a slave catcher. He even seemed to be fearing while cautioning me that I might be of a party to partake in recapturing him. He was soon lost to the Russian throngs. All of a sudden, a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness crept all over me. Here I was in the midst of human brothers and yet more fearful of them than of hungry lions. I kept my secret for as long as I could, but then I was forced to go out and search for an honest man, a man sufficiently human enough not to betray me. I found my man in Stewart, a sailor, warm-hearted and generous. He listened to my story with brotherly interest, and it took me home and went in search immediately for the late David Ruggles. Ruggles was an officer in the Underground Railroad who kept me safe for several days while my intended wife, Anna, came up from Baltimore after I had informed her that I was safe. We were married shortly thereafter. He restores my soul. In New Bedford, Massachusetts, where Anna and I was assured that we'd be safe, I observed heavy toil without the whip 
and incidents which assured me that Anne and I was amongst a sensible and thoughtful people. There were men there that told me that in the state constitution there, there was nothing preventing a colored man from seeking any office. Children went to school side by side with white children. And my new friends, they assured me that there were men there willing to lay down their lives before a slave would be taken there. I remember a story of a, of a colored man in a fugitive sleeve who had an argument and the former threatened the latter of informing his master of his whereabouts. A church meeting was set up and special provisions were made that the would-be Judas would be attending. At the end of the meeting, there was prayer by the leader for divine direction. And when he rose up, he said, well, friends, we have got him here. And I recommend you young men just take him outside the door and kill him. <laughs> and with that, they ran to the villain and would have killed him had he not made himself a veil of a window and made his good escape. <laughs> he never showed his face in New Bedford again. And you know why? Because the black people in New Bedford is educated up enough to fight for their freedom. Praise God. <laughs> It guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Among my first concern while in New Bedford was to join a church. I had never given up on my faith. I had become a little backslidden and lukewarm, but I still felt it was necessary for me to join a church. The southern slave-holding churches I can see through but I wasn't ready for what I saw in the Elm Street Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Surely these Christian people would have none of this feeling against color. And they certainly would see us as children of the same father and heirs of the same salvation on equal terms of theirs. It was the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the most sacred and solemn of all Christian ordinances. Pastor Bonnie, preached and after was the church remained to partake in the sacrament I was among about a half a dozen of colored members associated with the church and had descended from the gallery from where we had been ushered and I was anxious to observe the bearing of the colored members and the result was humiliating they looked like sheep without a shepherd. White members went forward by the bench floor. And when it was evident that all the white members had been served the bread and wine, Brother Bonnie, pious Brother Bonnie, after a long pause as if to make the necessary important point that all the white members had been served, raised his voice in an unnatural pitch and looked into the corner where his black sheep had been pinned up and beckoned with his hands, exclaiming, come forward with colored members, come forward. You too have interest in the blood of Christ. God is no respecter of persons. And the colored members, poor, slavish souls, went forward and I went out and I never been back to that church since. <laughs> There's been other churches that I tried in New Bethlehem with the same result. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Only months later, I was given a copy of a newspaper, The Liberator, edited by William Lord Garrison. It exposed hypocrisy and wickedness in high places. 
It made no truce for the traffickers of human bodies and souls of men. It preached human brotherhood, denounced oppression, and demanded the complete emancipation of my race. All the anti-slavery meetings in New Bedford I promptly attended. Oh, there was a grand anti-slavery convention in Nantucket in 1841. I had taken no holidays in the three years since my escape, working with my hands, sometimes all night and sometimes all day, working as a caulker. So I went to this convention, never supposing that I might partake in the proceedings. But a prominent abolitionist who had heard me speaking to my colored friends in a small church house sought me out in the crowd and asked if I could come up and say a few words. Oh, oh, it was with the utmost difficulty for me to even stand erect, for me to command and articulate two or three words without hesitation and stammering. All my limbs trembled, but the audience became so excited as myself, and then Garrison spoke after me, and it took me as his text, and it was a speech of unequal power that swept down like a tornado. That night, I was urgently solicited to join the anti-slavery society and publicly advocate its principles. Here was a new world for me. My years of freedom had been in hard labor as a way of supporting Anna and I and rearing up of our children. But I was young and hopeful, and I poured my whole heart into this holy cause. However, after years of preaching and and speaking with these gentlemen, it all became too mechanical for me. Telling my story, they would say, tell your story, Frederick, as I would walk up to the stage, night after night, tell your story. It was a new story for the audience, but it was an old story for me. I was reading and thinking a great deal at the time, and new ideas had been presented to my mind on the subject. I couldn't always obey. I even had men come up to me and say, tell your story, Frederick, but better have a little bit of that plantation manner about yourself. Tis not best you appear too educated. Then we say, Folks won't even believe you've been a slave, Frederick, if you keep it up this way. At times, I am still filled with unutterable loathing when I consider the religious pomp and show together with the horrible inconsistencies that surrounds me everywhere. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. At last, the trouble did come. In less than four years of public speaking with these gentlemen, folks began to doubt that I had ever been a slave, even believed that I had never been south of the Mason-Dixon line. Thought I was too intelligent. And since I couldn't reveal the name of my master, or the county or state where I was from for fear of being recaptured and sent back to them. It was decided by friends that I must leave for England. And after a humiliating color test for crossing the sea, which resulted in a, a lesser cabin, friends and others came to visit me, and I was invited to visit them in their cabin and very soon among most of the passengers. All color distinction was thrown to the wind. In a letter I wrote to Garrison, I said, I can truly say 
I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. Eleven days gone and I have experienced glorious enthusiasm with which thousands have flocked to hear the cruel wrongs of the downtrodden enslaved fellow countrymen and deep sympathy. I gaze around in vain for one who will question my equal humanity, claim me as his slave, or offer me insult. I employ a cab. I am seated by white people. I reach the hotel. I enter the same door. I am shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table, and no one is offended. I find no difficulty obtaining admission into any place of worship or amusement on equal terms. I meet with nothing that reminds me of my complexion. Ah, thank heaven. They measure and esteem men here according to their moral and intellectual worth and not according to the color of their skin. For 21 months, I stayed in England. And to my friends they I owe my freedom in America. On their own accord, without any solicitation by me, they raised funds sufficient enough to purchase my freedom in America. I could have stayed in England forever. But I felt it was my duty to perform here in America, to suffer and labor with the oppressor of my native land. So I returned. Thou dost prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. An example. I nearly all the railroads in New England at this time, about a, a dozen years ago. The custom of providing separate cars for colored travelers was established. So, I made a rule to seat myself in the accommodations of passengers generally. And then I would be asked to partake myself to the Jim Crow car, and I would refuse. And in anticipation of what I was about to subject myself to, I had interwoven myself into the seat. And it must have cost the railroad companies a whole lot of money because the seat would have been torn up with me and I'd be pulled out and dragged out with my seat. Dragged and beaten and bruised by brakemen and railroad conductors. Well, after many battles with railroad conductors, this method was finally abandoned. The Jim Crow car set up for the degradation of colored members is nowhere to be found in New Bethlehem. And that did not happen without the intervention of the people who threatened the enactment of the law, compelling railroad companies to respect the rights of all travelers. Praise God! <laughs> By the way, my friends in England, they, uh, they resolved to purchase me. of press and printing material. And I found myself wielding the pen as well as my voice to send oppression to the grave. However, while back in America, my friends in Boston earnestly opposed. I would, Sawyer offering himself to the public as an editor, a slave, bored up in the very depth of ignorance, assuming to instruct the highly civilized people of the North in the principles of, of humanity, liberty, and justice. Nevertheless, I persevered. The newspaper flourished for 16 years, and I only closed it during the war. And after a meeting with President Lincoln, 
under the belief that I was to be commissioned by the United States to be the first black officer. I was to be the assistant adjutant to General Thomas, who was then recruiting and organizing troops in the Mississippi Valley. My three sons were serving in that war. And after their splendid behavior and their ability to fight, to meet the foe in the open field, black soldiers on equal fitness with white soldiers to stop a bullet. Black men had proved themselves to be courageous and worthy. However, as time drew near, my friends felt it wasn't safe for me to go south for fear of my losing my life. Then I received traveling accommodations and no commission papers. And none ever came. But I'm grateful now for the outcome. For I was able to spend a essential time with my family. And I'm grateful for the steps made towards freedom since my escape in 1838. And I'm grateful for the Emancipation Proclamation and the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. In Romans, Paul the Apostle says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, that was American slavery. No marriage. No education, the light of the gospel, shut out from slaves and forbidden by law to read and write. It was such a giant sin, so hardening to the heart, so destructive to the moral sense of everyone around it that I feel abundantly justified to appeal to the whole world to aid in its removal wherever it be found. Slavery is a crime against God and against all human family, and it belongs to the entire human family to seek its suppression. I take my stand on behalf of all the uh, oppressed and the enslaved of all colors and of all nations and of all the world over. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. In a speech I delivered in November 1867, I said that a man's rights rest in three boxes, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. Let no man be kept from the ballot box because of his color. And let no woman be kept from the ballot box because of her sex. But what does all of this amount to, this freedom? If the black man, after having been made free by the letter of the law, is still unable to exercise this freedom, the real question is, do they mean to make good to us all the promises made in that glorious liberty document, the U.S. Constitution? I will now share with you a letter that I wrote to my master. I was finally able to challenge him to consider his horrible treatment of me and of my dear sisters. I said, it is an outrage upon the soul, a war upon the immortal spirit, and one from which you must give account at the bar of our common father and creator. 
how you can stagger under these many years. Your mind must have become darkened, your heart hardened, your conscience seared and petrified, or you would have long since thrown off the accursed load and sought relief at the hands of a sin-forgiven God. How, let me ask, would you look upon me where I, some dark night in company with a band of hardened villains, to enter to your elegant dwelling and seize the person of your own lovely daughter, Amanda, and carry her off from your family, friends, and all the loved ones of her youth. Make her my slave, compel her to work, and I take her wages. Place her name on my ledger as property, Disregard her personal rights. Fetter the powers of her rights and privilege of learning to read and write. Feed her coarsely. Clothe her scantily. And whip her on the back occasionally. And more and more still horrible. Leave her unprotected. A degraded victim to the brutal lust of fiendish overseers who would pollute, blight, blast, and blast out the, her fair souls, rob her of all her dignity, destroy her virtue, and annihilate in her person all the graces that adorn the character of virtuous womanhood. I ask, how would you regard me if such were my conduct? Oh, the vocabulary of the damn would not afford a word sufficiently infernal to express your idea of my God-provoking wickedness. Yet, sir, your treatment of my beloved sisters is precisely like the case I have just now supposed. I intend to make use of you as a weapon with which to assail the system of slavery as a means of concentrating public attention on this system and deepening the horrors of traffickers in the souls and bodies of men. In doing so, I entertain no malice towards you personally. There is no roof under which you would be more safe than mine, and there is nothing in my house which you might need for your comfort which I would not readily grant. Indeed, I should esteem it a privilege to set you as an example as to how mankind ought to treat each other. I am your fellow man, not your slave. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, dear ones, we must always find place for courage and perseverance. I here leave the subject. And I leave it off where I began, consoling myself and congratulating all friends of freedom on the fact that the anti-slavery cause is not a new thing under the sun. It has appeared in all ages and summoned its advocates from all ranks. Its foundations are laid in the deepest and holiest of convictions. Oh, does the everlasting hills, immovable as the throne of God, and certain as the purposes of eternal power against all hindrances, and despite the mutation of human instrumentalities, it is the faith of my soul that this holy cause will triumph. John me. My vow to the Lord, and I won't turn back. I will go. I 
shall go to see what the Titten, my Lord, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel. Jetting my Lord, deliver Daniel. Then why not and every man? Jetting my Lord, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel. Jetting my Lord, deliver Daniel. Ditching my Lord, deliver Daniel. Then I want not. 